All right. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Oh, everybody waving. Good. Now let's get started. We're going to look at uh, the book of Ruth. I hope you're keeping up with your reading uh, as you're going through, especially those that are doing achievement. Um, but I like the book of Ruth. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful story. Uh, we know that Ruth actually, uh, I wonder why it's not called the book of Naomi, but I understand why it's called the book of Ruth. Uh, because really it's about Naomi and her life and what she faced and went through. And uh, it's, it takes place during the time of the judges. And it's about more about Ruth and what she does than it is about Naomi and what she does. Now, Naomi follows her husband and is obedient to her husband. And when you read it, you'll find out that it started out with her going because of famine. Her and her husband moved out of Israel and went into the land of Moab because of the famine. And they ended up staying there. And in the process of time, her two sons ended up marrying two Moabitish women. Ruth is one and Orpheus the other. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, again, her husband ends up dying. And also both of her sons end up dying. When you look at this, you begin to question why would God do this, but in actual fact, they did what God told them not to do, which was to go to a strange country and intermingle with strange people, strange religions, and strange gods. And so we see here that now Naomi realizes that, you know, that she was better off back in her hometown of uh, in Israel, and so she makes it a decision to leave and go home. And she pulls uh, her two daughter-in-laws aside and says, Look, I'm too old, I can't have children, and if I did, would you wait around for them to be married to them so that you could raise up uh, sons to my son so that the family name would continue? And so she says, Go on back to your own homes. Go back to your own gods, go back to your own religion. Me, I'm going back to Israel. And so right away we see that Ruth makes a steep statement that is so profound. And that is, she says, I will not leave you. I'm going to go where you are. I'm going to be where your people will be my people and your God will be my God. So we know right away there must have been something that Ruth saw in Naomi that was different from her own family or her own family's background. <clears throat> we know that she makes a decision to turn her back on her own people, her own gods, and follow the God of Naomi. When Naomi and Ruth come back into the country of Israel, they are met and they say, isn't this Naomi? Well, Naomi means pleasant. And she says, no, don't call me Naomi anymore because call me Mara. In other words, she was not happy anymore. And uh, when that happens, <coughs> excuse me, it means bitter. It's quite this contrast between somebody who's pleasant to somebody who's bitter. And I don't think it's the word bitter to the point of referring to bitterness as we understand it. Because if you as a person allow bitterness to get into your life, it is one of the hardest things for you to root out of your life is if you have a spirit of bitterness. When Naomi refused, refers to herself as being bitter, I do believe it comes across as more being hurt. She has lost her husband. She has lost her 
her two sons. All she has is her daughter-in-law who is not her blood relation. <coughs> and so, so she goes and she begins to live where she normally had lived before she left and Ruth lives with her. And Naomi is of age so that she basically cannot go out and do the work that Ruth is about to do, but Ruth takes it upon herself to provide not just for herself, but for Naomi. And so we know that Ruth goes out in, and Naomi sends her out and she goes out to glean. Now what you understand about gleaning? Gleaning means that when they would go in the field, the reapers would cut down the wheat and some of the kernels would fall to the ground. Uh, some, of, some of the, even the little seeds would fall to the ground. And so the, the people who were cutting the wheat, it was always a law or a principle in Israel that they would cut the wheat, but anything that fell to the ground was to be left for the poor. They were never allowed to go along and scrape up every little bit of, of food. So what would happen, the poor would go and they would, uh, as we would say, hook up to the farmer and ask to glean or to go through the field and find any of the leftovers that they had because they had no way or, or, or any form of income. So Ruth was in this category. And so she began to glean in the fields. And we know that she began to glean in the field that belonged to Boaz. Boaz, we know, is a close uh, relative of Naomi. And so when Boaz comes on the scene, he looks and he sees this strange lady. And he asks his servant, who is this person? Who is this young woman over there that's gleaning in the field? He knows that she's there trying to... Uh, uh, work out a meager bit of food so that she can live. And immediately the servant says, this is Ruth, the daughter-in-law of Naomi. And immediately Boaz connects and realizes who she is and goes and talks to her. And, and, he, and the first thing that he begins to talk to her about is her decision to come. And he has heard about her already. Even before she's in the field, he's heard about her. And he takes note of her that she's come into his field and she begins to glean. When she's doing this, he, he, he uh, oh, I'm, not tr I'm trying to think of the right word, but he, he commends her. That's what I was trying to get to. He commends her for what she has done, not in the field, but how she has given up her own people and her own land and her own gods to come and live with her mother-in-law. And he commends her for her faith and her, her decision to do this in spite of the odds of anything being in her favor. She is really an outcast. She is a Moabite. Do you know why the Moabites were an outcast. It is because when Israel came into the land, they met them not with bread and water. And you read it in the Old Testament, it says that a Moabite is not allowed into the house of God forever. So she is an outcast, not only by the people, but by God. But we see that Ruth stays faithful. And so Boaz tells her, he said, look, you glean. I've given permission for you to stay in my field. You don't have to go look into another farm. You just keep coming to my field. Whatever we're reaping, whether we're doing the wheat or we're doing the barley or we're doing the corn, you just stay right here by my reapers. And I have even informed them that nobody is to touch you. Nobody is to harm you. Matter of fact, you can come over here and you can eat with the servants. You can dip your, he says, dip your morsel of bread in the vinegar. In other words, you can have whatever is on the table here. When, when he does this, it says a lot about what he knows about Ruth. He knows 
what she has done and he takes note of it and he rewards her even though she is to be despised. <clears throat> so we know that when uh, Ruth goes home and shows her mother-in-law what she has gleaned in the field, her mother-in-law is actually quite surprised that she has gleaned so much. But what her mother-in-law does not know is that Boaz has commanded his reapers that when they are threshing the corn, anybody know what it means by threshing? Threshing is when they would take and beat the, 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 the corn or they would beat the wheat and would knock off all the chaff and they would throw it up in the air and the wind would blow the chaff away and the seeds would fall to the ground. That's the part they wanted, the kernels. He informed them to let some of it fall. He made a statement, let handfuls of it fall so that Ruth could get it. That's why she went back to her mother-in-law with such a large amount because uh, Boaz not only commended her, but Boaz blessed her by making sure that she had enough food for herself and for Naomi. So she goes back and explains to her, and, and her mother says, mother-in-law says, well, who, whose field did you happen to work in? And she tells him, she said, oh, be good, good, because he is next of kin to us. Now we understand, and for those of you that don't, I'll explain a little bit, the, the terminology of next of kin was somebody who could redeem them or take them under their wing of protection. Because she, her husband was dead, because her sons were dead, she had nobody to provide for her. So what would happen in Jewish law is the next one or the next kin would take and be that hand of protection to take over the place of the sons or of her husband until she would marry again. But of course we know Naomi was up in age, so she was not going to remarry. So now Ruth... Uh, has explained all this and she goes out and she does and works in the fields in the harvest all through the harvest so um, Naomi notices that Ruth is coming back with with lots of blessings so she begins to suspect that Boaz has an interest and we see that play out because when when Boaz is in the threshing floor, she, she, Naomi begins to devise a plan. And she says, now listen to me, and this is what you need to do. And so, he, she says to Ruth, I want you to go out, and you'll take note, just stay away from the men while they're partying, while they're having their food, while they're drinking, while they're having a good time. But take note as to where Boaz goes and lays down for the night. Because during the threshing, the owner would not leave. Do you know why? Because that was his money. He was protecting his income. He was watching over and making sure nobody stole what was rightfully his. So he stayed with the workers to make sure that everything was done properly. And so he laid down, it uh, says, at, uh, at the bottom of a pile of corn or whatever that was, I can't remember, that they were threshing, and falls asleep. And she says, Naomi says to Ruth, when he falls asleep, go in and lay down at his feet. So we know that this probably happened after dark. <coughs> Excuse me, I've had a sinus infection for about a week and I'm just getting over it so I get a little tickle here so so Ruth does what her mother-in-law says and in the night Boaz stirs or turns or whatever and you know I don't know about you but I I have a tendency when I wake up in the night I do a big stretch before I and then go and turn over and go to sleep again and basically that's what Boaz did and he realizes there's somebody at his feet. 
And by her stating to Boaz, place your cloak over me. She wasn't just saying, you know, cover me up, I'm cold. When she made that statement to Boaz, she was saying, I'm yours if you want me. Because Boaz goes and covers her up and waits till the morning and sends her home and he declares to her that because of who she is and what she has done, he will perform the right of the kinsman, but there is somebody who is closer in that lineup than him. But if they won't perform it, he definitely will. In other words, he said he wanted to marry Ruth if it's possible. But he gives her a blessing again and sends her home before any of the other men wake up because he, he does not want to put a bad name against Ruth. All that she has done so far has made her look good to the children of Israel and to the people of God and so therefore he doesn't want to put a mark against her and he says quickly go before the men wake up and realize there was a woman in the floor or there was a woman laying in the bed here that n last night. And so Boaz does what he says and goes to the gate now, when, you, when the Bible refers to the gate of a city, that gate refers to a place of authority or a place where they would meet to discuss things. It could either be judgmental or it could be, uh, like in this case, the selling of land or any kind of a question. That's where men would meet and they would discuss it. In other words, it was a place of authority. So Boaz goes and waits in the place of authority until he sees the man that is next to kin that is closer to Naomi than himself. And he pulls him aside and says, Now listen, Naomi is selling a parcel of ground, and because of the kinship rule, it was given to the next of kin to buy it. And immediately as soon as the kinsman found out that Naomi was selling the parcel of ground, he said, I'll take it. Just like that. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll redeem it. I want it for myself. Because it made his uh, inheritance much bigger, much better. And so they, they go through it. But then as soon as he says, I'll take it, he reminds him. He said, now listen, you've got to understand something. You're not only going to have to pay Naomi for that parcel of ground, but you're going to have to pay Ruth also because she owns it too because she was married to Naomi's son. And, and immediately he spent, I said, look, he said, I can't spend that kind of money. That, well, that's what we would say today. I can't spend that kind of money. He said, no, no. He said, I'm not going to redeem it. He said, go ahead, you redeem it for yourself. And so Boaz removes his shoe in, in, in the sight of all the men or the leaders of the city and declares his purpose and his desire and the fact that he is going to take Ruth as his wife. Now again, this was a rule in Israel in that time that if the next the kinsman did not purchase it, this is why the removing of the shoe and everything else was it was all part of the deal. It was, it was He was saying, no, no, I'm not going to mar, and, and the way it says it, I'm not going to mar my inheritance. In other words, I'm not going to ruin what I have by paying out all this money and destroy what I have. He said, no, no, you do it. And so the deal was made. And we know that Boaz takes Ruth and she becomes his wife. When Ruth and Boaz are married, they have a son. Does anybody know what the son's name is? Anybody? Obed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Obed. Who is the father of... Anybody? Jesse. Thank you. Keep going. Who is? The father of David. The father of David. Who is the descendant of... Who? 
Thank you. That is the most beautiful part of this whole story. Ruth became a part of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. She was rejected. She was despised. She was not allowed in the presence of God forever. And yet, because of her desire, because of her choices, because of her love for the God of Naomi, she became a part of the descendant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is mercy. That is grace personified. She was never supposed to be a part of the house of Israel. But you see, she despised her old life. That sounds, does that sound familiar or not? She despised her old life and chose a life that followed God. And when she did this, look where God took her. I, can, I, I, I don't know about you, but I can almost relate to that. No, I can't almost. I know I can relate to that. Forget. It's not almost. I can relate to that. I remember what my old life was like. I despise it. I don't want it. I don't ever want it. But look where God has brought my wife and I. The same with you. Where, look where God has brought you from. Now, I'm just going to look at a, a little bit of a contrast because this happened during the time of the judges. But let's look at Ruth and look at, look at judges. Ruth is all about fidelity and purity. She has pure motives. She has pure desire. She, she's faithful to God. But yet in Judges, we read it's all about what? Immort immortality. They, they want to do everything that pleases the flesh. Ruth didn't want to please the flesh. She wanted to please her mother-in-law. She wanted to please God. Ruth is all about integrity in worship. She said, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. But yet when we read Judges, it's all about idolatry in worship. They, they started messing around with all the other uh, people's religious world. They should have been changing those people. They should have been shown the true God, but they weren't. They followed their God. Ruth did the opposite. She followed the God of Naomi. Naomi, wow. Ruth was all about devotion. We see how she treated her mother-in-law, how she treated her mm, family that she married into. Where we see in Judges, it's all about a decline in devotion. Ruth is all about love for her mother-in-law and for her mother-in-law's God. Judges is all about personal lust. Ruth is all about peace. Judges is all about war. Ruth is all about kindness. She was kind to her mother-in-law. She could have went back to her family and had it easy. She, yes, she could have got married to another and, you know, maybe had a good life, but she didn't. She showed the kindness that we should be showing to others in our love for God. We should be showing that kindness to this world. We don't, anyways, we don't treat them nicely. But yet we see judges as all about cruelty. Ruth is all about the blessing of obedience. Because she was obedient, again, she became a part of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. And we see Judges, when we read through Judges, it's the curse of disobedience. In Ruth, we see spiritual light because of her love for God. But yet in Judges, we see spiritual darkness. Ruth was written around the same time or lived around the same time as the judges, but yet we see that the book of Ruth is written separately from the book of Judges because there is such a contrast between the two 
<coughs> that they really don't need to be incorporated together. We see Ruth love for God, love for people that weren't her own. And uh, we see how that God blesses her. We see how God elevates her and brings her into his promise. Do you know, I don't know how many of you have ever read throughout the whole Bible, but it would be good for you to do it. Uh, I try to do it at least once a year. But also, when I'm looking through it, I see different people who are despised, who are looked down upon because <clears throat> they are classified as low of the low. But yet, because of their desire, God elevates them to places of grandeur, a place of purpose. One is Rahab in the book of Joshua. She was a harlot. She was despised. She was a nobody. But yet, because of her, her whole family was spared and she got to live in the house of Israel. Ruth, another one, because she was a Moabitess. Next one, Bathsheba. She was an adulteress. Tamar. She was and played the part of a harlot. These four women all became a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. If we looked on people's circumstances, if we looked at people today, that drunk sitting on the side of the road who can't get up, if we look at them in their circumstances, we will walk by them. But I wonder what would happen if we would look at them through God's eyes and not see where they are, but see where they can be. What would we do? It's quite interesting to realize that when you show a little bit of kindness, how it affects somebody's life. And I'm not I'm advocating that we go out and throw money into all these people who sit along the side of the street that are beggars. And then, I'm not advocating that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'll tell you that when Peter and John went up to the temple, they went up every day at the hour of prayer. But all of a sudden on this particular day, they saw the beggar that was sitting at the, at the side of the road by the gate beautiful. It was on that particular day that that man received the healing. We might see these people on everyday basis, but then on, there's going to come a certain day where God's going to speak to us and we're going to feel love and compassion and if we would go over and show some kindness to somebody. We don't know where God will take them. I know of people who were drunkards, who are now preachers. I know people who are harlots who are now ministers' wives. There are people in this world, in this organization that we live in, and you know them too, where God has raised them up out of uh, the depths of drudgery and placed them in places of prominence because of His purpose. And it was all to do with the desire they had to serve God. You know, when we look at the book of Ruth, when we begin to 
look at it, we see that in chapters 1 and 2, we see where Ruth's love is demonstrated in the way she treats Naomi. But the way it's demonstrated changes in chapter 3 and 4 because Ruth's love towards Naomi is rewarded with what she gets. In Ruth, in chapters 1 and 2, we see the death of a family. And we see where Ruth cares for Naomi. But in chapters 3 and 4, we see where Boaz cares for Ruth. For Ruth and we see the birth of a family. Because Obed's on the scene. What a strong distinction between the two of them. Your attitude today depicts where you will be tomorrow. Now, if you want to write something down, this is, this, is, this is something you might want to write down. Attitude depicts altitude. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say that? The, the way your attitude is towards the things of God it will decide for you how far or how high or where you go in the things of God. We read where Ruth despised her old spiritual life for her new spiritual life. And look where it took her. If we would change our attitude and get a hold of the things of God... As the preacher that preached for us last week, Brother Kelsey, who was over from Canada, was with us last week, he preached, and he said about being a pursuer. And he brought it out so beautifully, and I'm not going to try and preach his message, but you see that, being that pursuer, desiring the things of God, desiring the principles of God, and, and, and the life that God has for us, is dictates as to how far we go in God. Book of Ruth. It's only a small book, but it's a profound one. Now we're going to look at, and I'll watch the time, Samuel, 1 Samuel for a little bit. We won't get it all finished today, but we will look at some of it, and then we'll go finish it up next time. 1 Samuel, <laughs> a lot of it that goes on here in 1 Samuel, we, we all know the story of how Hannah comes and she's actually in the temple, she's praying and seeking God and Eli, who's the priest, he's looking over there, he sees her lips moving but doesn't see, hear any voice, so he thinks she's drunk, is what we would say, and so he thinks... She, and he tells her, he said, put the bottle of wine away and serve God. And she says, no, no, I, I'm not drinking. And she said, I've just got sorrow of heart. Because you see, Hannah couldn't have children. But she didn't complain. She did what she was supposed to do. And she cried for and prayed for a child. But here is the other part. She made an oath about the child. She said, if you give me a man-child, I will give it back to you. I will lend it back to you. And we know that, uh, that this is what happens. We'll go that in a few more moments. But she goes home from that few moments in the presence of 